Ladies and gentlemen, in this Shrug Game Tedicom video, we're going to be discussing the Xbox One S technical specifications. So, a while back, there was an interview conducted where the Coalition confirmed that they were running Gears of War 4 at better frame rates, with overall better quality, with the Xbox One S compared to the launch model system, which was a bit of a head scratcher because Microsoft went on record a little bit later and said well you know that's not really the case and there was a lot of umming and ahhing going around and to say that it was a bit confusing is an understatement. However Albert Pinello from Microsoft has finally um, given us some information on what the changes are inside the system and this was thanks to an interview with Eurogamer. So first things first the actual sock for the most part is exactly the same we'll go into the changes um, slowly throughout this video but it's still essentially for the sake of games the same sock so it has still 32 megabytes of ES RAM there's no higher bandwidth memory there's no GDDR5 memory it's still DDR3 and I'm aware that that's not part of the sock before you comment in the video and so on and so on but there are a couple of subtle differences. Firstly, it's built on a different uh, manufacturing process. It's built on 16nm FinFET, which obviously helps to reduce power consumption, reduce the heat output, and so on. But the major changes are clock speed for the GPU, which is from 853 megahertz of the previous system to up to, up to about 914 megahertz. And additionally, they have also increased the clock speed of the ESRAM. Now, bear in mind that the ESRAM bandwidth does scale proportionally with the GPU clock. So, the peak performance is from 204 gigabytes per second at the moment up to around 219 gigabytes per second. Now, it's very important to remember that peak bandwidth and sustained bandwidth are very different. Uh, beasts indeed and we've tackled this a lot when we were discussing the Xbox One's SDK and Microsoft themselves do admit that the actual real throughput of the ESRAM is in real world scenarios considerably less. In fact I'm going to read out a quote from the Xbox One development kit. Bear in mind this was before they raised the uh, clocks of some of the components but here we go. The maximum theoretical combined ESRAM read and write bandwidth is 192 gigabytes per second. Once again, I just want to clarify, the 192 gigabytes per second figure was back when the A uh, Xbox One's GPU used to be 800 megahertz back in the development kit. So just want to get that out there. Moving back to the quote, is 192 gigabytes per second. However, this level is not sustainable and is not even achievable in practice except in quote, short bursts. Most rendering scenarios should plan for peak ESRAM bandwidth of 102 gigabytes per second. In some color blending and read, modify, write, compute shader scenarios, sustained of 110 to 133 is achievable in practice. Such high bandwidth and lower latency makes ESRAM a valuable memory resource for the GPU and the ESRAM bandwidth shared between the GPU, DMA en engines, and video encode and decode, end quote. Furthermore, the Xbox One's CPU remains the same clocks as previously, so it still has the advantage compared to the PlayStation 4. It's running at 1.75 GHz, but there is no increase there at all. So it's purely a GPU upclock. Now, the primary reason Microsoft have decided to do this comes down to one thing and one thing only, HDR rendering, which is, of course, standing for High Dynamic Range. Now, Albert Pinello has said, and I quote, the extra performance is needed to render real-time non-HDR versions of the game for game DVR, streaming, and screenshots. Now, traditionally, games use what is known as tone mapping. So, the game is rendered in high dynamic range, and then tone mapping converts those colors down to the best approximation of what the system thinks that the colors of your display are capable of showing. If that sounds like gobbledygook to you, tone mapping is kind of a complex topic, but all you need to know is that, let's say, for the sake of simplicity's um, sake, 
that you have the absolute highest shade of red possible. So 255 red, zero green, zero blue. So it's the purest red you can possibly have. The game internally is saying this wall is pure blood red. It's the, it's the reddest color you can get. Now, the console knows that that is the color the developers wanted and then tone mapping will say, okay, this display needs to show that color the best it can. That's the simplistic way of explaining what that, what tone mapping is. If someone wants to do some Googling, that would be fantastic. But we've discussed it a couple of times previously, especially with an interview with Mr. Robert Halleck from AMD. So do check that out if you want more information on what tone mapping is. But that's the simplistic version of it. So the big question is, okay, the system is capable of 4K. We all know that. Um, there are multiple changes internally. For example, there's a 4K HEVC decoder uh, that's been added to the SOC to render compressed video streams. They've added HDMI 2 and a HDCP 2.2 compliant technologies, which is obviously pretty standard. All of that is traditional and it's required to, uh, in the case of HDMI 2.0, provide the high bandwidth. Remember, when you're talking with digital signals, HDMI, DVI, those type of connections, it's all bandwidth, it's not analog. So essentially you're sending data to the screen. So of all of that said, um, the system now is easily capable of running 4K playback. But that leads to the logical follow-up, what about games? Can games in a theoretical world actually run at 4K resolution? The answer is yes, but with a massive asterisk. So, let's say that you are trying to run The Division. Well, you couldn't really run that at 4K simply because the console would be not capable of outputting the resolution at a decent frame rate. Uh, you can upscale by all means, which is a completely different um, kettle of fish, but to active, actively natively render the game at that resolution, you're looking at uh, four times the number of pixels compared to 1080p. However, what you could do is you could run an indie game that let's say is pretty simplistic. I know I always use this example, but let's say something along the lines of Limbo, you could natively render that at 4K or an intermediary resolution, for example, 1440p. So in a theoretical world, if a developer decided to run a game at, let's say, once again, 1440p, the game would look crisper, it would look nicer than the native, uh, sorry, than the same game if it was running on a regular system, assuming you were running on a 4K television. So there are some questions which I know people are gonna ask in the comments. A, how does it stack up to the PS4? B, how does it stack up to the Neo? C, how does it stack up to the Scorpio? And I guess the last question, the logical one is, is it worth buying an S if you already own an Xbox One? Well, these are my opinions, especially on the latter, on the latter question. But first of all, the Xbox One S is 1.4 T-flops compared to the PS4's 1.84 T-flops. The Neo has 4.2 and the Scorpio just ruffle stomps everything on the list because it has 6 T-flops. Uh, those are not theoretical numbers, by the way. These have been confirmed. Well, the Neo technically hasn't been 100% confirmed. Developers and leaks have confirmed it, but Sony themselves have not confirmed it. So theoretically, Microsoft could face stiffer competition with Neo if Sony decide to increase the clock speeds of the GPU. But from the current leaks, 4.2 is accurate with the Neo, and 6 is definitely accurate with the Scorpio because Microsoft have released trailers, which tell us it's got 6 T-flops. So the Xbox One S and the Xbox One have about point uh, have about 100 G-flops between them, slightly less, about 80 actually. So is it is it worthy of an upgrade? Well, Here's the thing, I would personally not recommend the average Xbox One owner to upgrade to an Xbox One S. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't, but if you have a 4K television, I would definitely be tempted if you do a lot of streaming. I would also be tempted to do it if your Xbox One is getting a little bit long in the tooth, maybe you've, you know, maybe you want the additional features, perhaps 
for the sake of argument you need the smaller space maybe you can get a good deal on the trade in those type of scenarios i can definitely say yes i i would suggest it but if you're new to an xbox um, ecosystem and you're thinking huh this is actually a pretty good deal right now I could get myself an Xbox One S with whatever games are available yeah I could definitely suggest it it's it's a pretty good deal and you do get better performance I mean it, it's around 10% faster in a lot of tests obviously the game needs to be not locked to the frame rate and your mileage will vary depending um, so it's definitely an improvement in the level of performance that the system's putting out. The problem is, the only issue, the only reason I'm not personally suggesting to rush out and buy an Xbox One S right now for owners of the current Xbox One is because of Scorpio, which is going to be released next year. Now, I know, I know, I'm 100% aware that that's quite a long way away. It's, you know, well, let's say it's released in Christmas. So you're looking at, say, 16-ish months. So that's quite a long time. But at the same time, it, the Xbox One S is going to be ruffle stomped by the Scorpio. Um, so it really comes down to your perspective. Like, do you want a cooler running console? Does the extra... Uh, does the shrunken size mean anything to you? Do you like the idea of 4K native um, streaming? Do you like the idea of perhaps slightly better performing games? If what, if so, by all means, sell your current Xbox and grab it. If you own a PS4 or maybe even a Wii U and you're thinking, hmm, kind of actually wouldn't mind an Xbox One for, you know, my friend Bob owns an Xbox One and, you know, Joanne owns an Xbox One, I'd like to play online with them, sounds like a great idea, then by all means, Xbox One S is certainly a great starting point. And who knows what the hell the Scorpio is going to cost on launch, that's the other thing. It's like, Microsoft can tell me it provides, you know, um, five pounds of gold every day. You know, it lays an egg, but if it's going to cost a hell of a lot of money to purchase, then that doesn't really help me. Honestly, I think it's going to be a lot more expensive than the Xbox One S, simply because, obviously, the components inside the machine, um, we don't know a hell of a lot about them, but we know it's going to be using at least GDDR5 uh, memory. I did do a full technical analysis. I'll link it in the video description if, you're, if you've not watched it yet of the uh, Scorpio. But it's going to have a vastly more powerful GPU, it's got a lot more memory bandwidth, and it's probably going to have a whole bunch of other components and internals which obviously cost more to money to produce. So I wouldn't be surprised if you're looking at like another $100, $200 on top of the cost of the Xbox One S. So for many people that's kind of verging in the owie territory, to be honest. that That's kind of the, the ow, I don't necessarily know if I want to spend that on a console. But it's up to you. But for the Xbox One S, it's looking a really nice system. And I personally am not going to upgrade. Personally. I personally am quite happy with my PC for you know higher resolution gaming or for high resolution streaming, that type of thing. And I'm just going to use my Xbox One for exclusive games. And I'm happy for that for the moment. But I'm primarily a PC gamer. However, with the Xbox Scorpio, I'm definitely going to be purchasing it on launch and um, seeing what, what's up, basically. So, hopefully you've enjoyed the video and at least found it somewhat informative. Um, yeah. Usual things. If you've enjoyed the video, do the likey, subscribey, commenty thing. But... I'm going to shoot off because I've got a lot of stuff to do over the next couple of hours, actually. It's running quite late here in the UK, unfortunately. Um, I've been kind of busy with the Kronos follow-up because I had to make a couple of amendments to the articles and I've also had to do a little bit of uh, other stuff in the background. But hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon, guys. Take care. Bye for now.